Do we have a title page up there, Sam? Well, hello everyone, um, Giles Parkinson here. Um, you're in the right place, thanks for joining us. We're gonna get going in about sort of half a minute once if just to give time for people to join this um, webinar. So um, if you just sort of hang on for a while and apologies, we should probably have some background music, but um, anyway, we'll be back in about 30 seconds or 40 seconds. Okay, um, hello everyone, we seem to have a quorum at the moment. Um, welcome to this webinar. Um, it's our first webinar of 2023, which promises to be a really interesting year for the um, green energy transition. And this one, um, as you can probably see, is entitled Crisis, Contingencies and the Green Energy Transition. And what we're going to be doing today is basically sort of taking a bit of a broader lens, sort of looking at the green energy transition as a whole and just some of the factors which are either sort of accelerating it or possibly slowing it down. Um, looking at where Australia fits into this um, green energy transition, particularly in the ability to attract capital. Um, also, its kind of leadership role, particularly in the electricity grid. And then we can also be taking a deep dive into some of the issues and the challenges of, you know, how do we accommodate sort of this much wind and solar? How do we get towards 100% renewables and particularly some of the issues in the markets, the role of batteries, uh, frequency services and things like that. So kind of a bit of a mixture of a broader view and then a bit of a telescope into some of the um, particular challenges. But we've got a great um, lineup of um, people um, for this webcast. Uh, we have, um, I'll probably introduce you now, I don't know whether they're going to, oh, for those who don't know, my name's Giles Parkinson, I'm the editor of Renew Economy, um, along with the EV focused uh, The Driven and One Step Off The Grid. And our guests today include Tim Buckley, who I think is probably well known to you. He's the founder and director of Climate Energy Finance. Um, he's had more than 30 years experience um, in stock markets and equity markets and things like that and being the uh, head of equities um, person for one of the world's major investment banks. Um, we're also joined by uh, Ed Ahmed, the Regional Director in Australia for Grid Beyond, who I should add are the sponsors of this webcast, and also Lisa Bork, who's the Sales Director for Grid Beyond in Australia. So what we're going to do is that Tim and I are going to be sort of start off with a conversation uh, about some of the broader themes in the um, in the green transition world. And then we're going to hear from Lisa and Ed, who will be sharing a presentation, um, deep dive into um, Australia. And then we hope to have some of your questions and answers. So we imagine the sort of the formal part or the introduction part will take about half an hour, maybe a bit over that. And then we'll have about 20, 25 minutes or even half an hour for questions if there's that many. So um, now just a reminder, if you do, I mean, you work, there's a chat um, little icon there, which you can use just to sort of um, talk about the weather and anything else that you feel to talk about, soccer scores, um, or even the green energy transition. If you do want to ask a question, please use the Q&A icon, because that's where I'll be looking to sort of moderate those questions and sort of um, filtering them around between uh, various presenters. So um, once again, thanks very much for joining this um, webinar. Um, we'll get going now. Tim, how are you? Good afternoon, Giles. Great to be here. I'm well. 2023 is shaping up to be such a big year, and there's so many themes which are playing on this. You know, we've got things like um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the lingering impacts of that and what that's done to the fossil fuel markets. And more importantly, what it's actually done to the European consumption of fossil fuels. We've got Joe Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, which has seemed to be putting pressures. Everyone's going, waking up in Australia and going, 
oops, what's that going to mean? All of a sudden, all these technologies are going to be so much cheaper in the US than they are in Australia. Are we going to get the capital to um, for investable projects in Australia? And I presume there's just all the different things which are sort of happening around the world. Um, we've got the safeguard mechanism in Australia and various politics, and we've also got you know the impact of China and what's happening there. Where should we start here, um, Tim? Um, you know, there's been a lot of response from the Russian invasion of Ukraine and what that means to the green energy transition. People speculating: did it slow it down? Did it speed it up? What's your take? Yes, it's certainly been huge in the global implications, Putin's invasion of the Ukraine, but also the European and Western market response um, to the Russian invasion. So sanctions against Russia have meant that the world's second largest exporter of fossil fuels is now very much restricted in their supply. They did actually game the system well before they invaded Ukraine to make sure everyone's on a uh, uh, short leash, zero reserves. And so the resulting sanctions have really, really resulted in skyrocketing fossil fuel commodity prices. That was really epitomised last week when we saw all six of the Western oil and gas majors reporting absolute record high profits, collectively more than $200 billion of profit in one year, the highest ever for that group of six companies. And yet their response is also really telling when you look at it, record high dividends, so rewarding shareholders. Secondly, massive, massive share buybacks, like uh, Chevron alone announced a $75 billion share buyback, US dollars, real dollars. $75 billion buyback. Now, what that's telling you is record high dividends, record high buybacks means that they're not actually investing in new supply, anywhere near what they need to be doing. So whether that's fossil fuels or um, far more aligned with climate science and the climate emergency, investing in zero emission solutions of the future. And so maybe two quick data points on that. We saw BP, Bernard Looney, I, three years ago when he was appointed CEO of BP, I was really, really hopeful that maybe the second time around Beyond Petroleum might have got it right. He certainly committed his career to it, but last week we saw him walking back those commitments in the face of war profiteering. And so he's really uh, reduced his climate ambitions quite dramatically for BP. And ultimately, it's obvious the financial markets have seen his stock underperform, his competitors, his peers. And lo and behold, if you underperform, you get sacked. So rather than getting sacked, he's walked it back. Now, the final data point I'll give you was another disappointing thing from um, America. We saw Exxon last week announce that they were terminating their bioalgae fuel program. Now, not a topic I've focused on a lot because there's been no financial uh, evidence to really support it, but Exxon's put in $350 million in the last five years. And as the CEO of the company they were sponsoring to do the research, development and deployment said, the technology breakthroughs in the last five years in bioalgae, they improved productivity 500% in five years, 700%, sorry, in five years. So massive improvement. Now, still not commercially viable, but Exxon, who's used it as their core greenwashing technique, they don't invest in wind, they don't invest in solar, they don't invest in batteries, they don't invest in decarbonisation, but they did bet on bioalgae. But now that it's starting to come good, they've pulled all their funding. And so, again, this, to me... This sounds, this sounds familiar, Tim. I think we've sort of seen this probably in the EV industry and in the solar industry in the past. This sounds all like really bad news. But at the same time, we've seen in Europe, which is obviously the most directly impacted by the sort of the Russian sanctions, and we thought, well, what are you going to do now? You haven't got any Russian gas. You know, the lights are going to go out. You're not going to you're going to, you're going to freeze to death. Turns out, even, and despite the fact that, you know, um, a lot of the French nuclear fleet was idle because of various problems... Despite that, all of that, um, it didn't seem to come to pass. And there's just been this extraordinary, massive transition. So while you've got the big six super majors that you just talked about, sort of making huge amounts of money, but not investing into the future or even their past technologies, you've actually got a whole European, you've got a whole continent, probably the second or third biggest economy in the world, saying, gee, 
we've got through this okay. We've kind of shut down the gas. We've actually found alternatives now and rapidly increasing their sort of transition. Just today, for instance, they've actually finalised the commitment to phasing out, to banning the sale of um, fossil fuel cars from 2035 in continent wide. So isn't that a good thing in the sense? I mean, so you've got this sort of, you've got the six majors digging their head into the ground or the oil wells, and yet, yet you've got these governments accelerating, pushing the, pushing the green button, if you like. No, Giles, you're right. I, you're good to pull me up on the negativity. It's easy when you're talking about the fossil fuel incumbent Luddites, the climate science deniers. Um, of course, they are trying to hold back the tide, but it's, if anything, it's absolutely accelerated in the last 12 months. And I've, in fact, never been more bullish than I am today. The opportunities for the world, the opportunities for Australia are huge. Uh, climate Energy Finance, we've just published a new report, which is titled A Once in a Century Opportunity for Australia. It is, we will be a renewable energy and value-added critical mineral superpower, as Ross Garneau has been telling us for, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. It is absolutely ours to be seized. But I'll pick up on the point you made. There's been a absolutely policy shift globally. Now, we know China leads the world. China installed 87 gigawatts of solar just in the last 12 months, 60% growth year on year. They lead the world. They have for a decade, and they continue to be by far the biggest investor. But as you said, Europe has responded um, to the in Inflation Reduction Act of President Biden by doubling down on massive industry and financial policy support for decarbonisation. So the EU Commissioner has announced that she's introduced Introducing a new industry act to decarbonize, to double down on industry um, investments in decarbonization in Europe. So that was her pitch at Davos. She's gone back to Europe and is absolutely pushing that through at a great rate of knots. In America, we've heard about the IRA, 369 billion, but behind that, it's actually more like 800, 900, a trillion US dollars when you put in the US DOE. And then we just in December got the GX roadmap in Japan, a $20 trillion decarbonization stimulus by the Japanese government in domestic industry. So I, I'll finish by saying I am really bullish for Australia, but we can't underestimate the global policy financial support and the idea that Australia is going to leave it to a free market when America is doing the biggest subsidy program in their history. Europe's doing their biggest subsidy program. We know China is a state-owned enterprise. So therefore, why would we leave it to the uh, private industry? We really need to have the National um, Reconstruction Fund, the Regional Powering the Regions Fund. We need the NAIF and we need the CEFC and we need the Future Fund. We need the government to work in partnership with private private because this is a once in a century opportunity for Australia. The investments yep. are in the hundreds of billions of dollars. So just one one quick final question in this part of the uh, webinar. Um, Australia has asked for advice on how to respond to the Inflation Reduction Act and um, obviously to the EU um, response because it's going gangbusters, as you've mentioned, Japan and China, of course. And Finkel apparently has prepared a report. I think it's been delivered there last week. What would you think would or should be in that? And what do you expect um, that to see? I mean, is it about really just deploying these various funds that, um, that you've been talked about or does it need to go more than that? Yeah, we actually launched the Climate uh, Capital Forum actually recommending a response on the IRA to the federal government two weeks ago with the Smart Energy Council. I'd imagine Finkel will come to the same sort of conclusions. Dr. Alan Finkel has uh, certainly been studying the global transition, he's really started to talk quite openly about the massive critical minerals opportunity for Australia. He's already talked for the last six, seven, eight years about the massive opportunity of Australia having 700% renewables, very much as Darren Miller at Arena has said. So what will be in the Finkel Review, I can't say, but what I could say is it will be all about how we need the government to set the right policy strategic framework and to put in capital, public capital, patient capital, that can be infrastructure, debt, equity, VC capital, grant funding. I recommend all of the above because even though Australia is a small country, the opportunity for Australia is as big as it is for America or Europe. And I'll, say, I'll, I'll emphasize that we produced 50% of the world's lithium last year, 50%, not 1.5%, 50 
Lithium's doubling and doubling and doubling again. And secondly, we produce 38% of the world's iron ore. We need to produce green iron and export. I'm sorry, just making sure I didn't say green steel, green iron. I don't want to compete with Japan, Korea and China. I want Australia to partner with Japan, Korea and China and help them decarbonize. So that changes the whole political narrative for the Albanese government. So Australia works and exports embody decarbonization in all of our critical minerals and critical metals. And that drives a global acceleration of investment and decarbonization. So rather than Australia being the third largest fossil fuel exporter, one of the three largest Luddites and science, climate science deniers, we become a world leading advocate for decarbonization globally. So I think Australia is beautifully positioned. Good on you, Tim. Well, thank you very much. That will come back to you um, after the next phase of this webinar and uh, particularly in the um, Q&A. So and once again, I remind people, um, there's a Q&A little icon down at the bottom of your screen. So if you've got any questions for Tim or for Ed or for Lisa, um, please line them up and we'll get to them after the presentation. Now, Tim talks about the opportunities for Australia. A lot of that's to do with exports. I guess nothing's going to happen with this green energy transition unless we actually get towards 100% renewables and electricity grid. And it's quite important to note that um, in Australia, we're making huge progress. So, you know, in the energy industry, we understand what's happening in South Australia, 70% renewables in the last 12 months, over the last couple of quarters, 80% renewables. That's important because it's broken the nexus between the sort of the gas price and the electricity price. This is really important. Um, there are really big programs, commitments now by the state governments in New South Wales, to basically a new roadmap to kick out coal or to sort of, you know, to replace coal within a decade. You've got Victoria with a 95% renewable energy target by 2035, effectively ending brown coal, and Queensland an 80% renewable target by 2035, which would mean that all but a few of its um, black coal generators gone. Um, everyone thinks it's possible, but of course there are challenges on how this is done and some of the technology. So I think we're going to hear a bit more about this in this next phase of the um, this webinar. I think it's going to be really interesting. So first of all, I'd like to, um, we're going to hand over now to um, Lisa and Ed from Grid Beyond. And um, Lisa, I think you are first up in the um, in, in the presentation. So I'm going to hand it over to you. This is um, Lisa Bulk um, from Grid Beyond in Australia, followed by Ed Ahmed from Grid Beyond. Um, I think that'll take us up for the next 15 and 20 minutes, and then we'll come back with questions. So Lisa, over to you in the presentation. Thanks, Charles. I'm just going to share my screen here. Sure. Let's get into presentation mode. Oh, sorry trying to I'm not sure how to move this bar across there we go apologies you see that okay Giles perfect that looks beautiful excellent Thank you. I'll over here for a sec because it's just going to get in my way um yeah thanks Giles for um introducing me I'm Lisa I'm the sales director here in Australia from Grid Beyond so today just on the back of what Giles and Tim have been talking about both Ed and myself are going to dive in a little bit more to uh, the Australian market. We've also, uh, on the back of a white paper we did for Grid Beyond um, uh, earlier this year, we had we run a poll, not only through LinkedIn, but also via our client database. Um, we had, you know, overwhelming response from that. So we want to share some of the thoughts and insights we received from that. And overall, then Ed will talk to you about um, with the volatility at the moment and obviously uncertainty in the market, there's there's a lot of ways that technology can actually assist you in uh, monetizing and creating new revenue streams, which we'll get into a little bit as well. So that's myself and that's Ed. So for the purposes of today, as I just said, the overarching theme is uh, the energy sector in two, 2023. Uh, we'll be talking about the trilemmas of the economy around the, which continue to feel the impacts of the high and volatile energy prices. Um, we'll drill down into volatility and high prices, renewables, the surging EV sales and electrification, decarbonisation, um, a little bit about legislation and market changes, and then how this can inevitably be, you know, turned into an opportunity for yourselves. 
really briefly, because we don't have a lot of time here today, a little bit of background about uh, Grid Beyond. We were founded 15 years ago in Ireland. Since then, we now are a global business effectively. We're all throughout uh, the UK, um, America, Japan, and most recently Australia. We have actually over 450 customers across 500 sites now. Decent sized team for a relatively small business of 100 people across six offices. And at any one point in time, we're managing 1500 megawatts of, DR, of a DR portfolio. These are some of our business partners down here below. Um, how's the energy market, how the energy markets are changing? So obviously, as we transition out of renewable, oh, sorry, out of thermal energy into renewable power, this brings volatility, it brings change, and it brings uncertainty. Um, the trilemma that I mentioned before essentially consists of, you know, how do I keep energy costs as low as possible? How do we ensure security of power supply as we transition through to these, these stages? And from a corporate responsibility point of view, how do we meet our sustainability targets? So volatility brings volatility brings risk and challenges. Some of those challenges uh, are definitely grid challenges, and this isn't uh, just Australia, the Australian market. These are grid challenges that are, are being seen all across the globe. Challenges, uh, you know, how do we produce, store, and manage electricity as we're transforming the industry into renewables? Uh, we're decreasing fossil fuels and nu nuclear plants um, and obviously increasing inter intermittent renewables, um, you know, has its own challenges. We have to look at storage, how we manage that. Um, and then also what's becoming, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in my next couple of slides, the increase in electrification of new sectors and the impact that that's, we're starting to see um, globally on that as well. And then obviously ancillary services and uh, demand or supply and demand reduction. And you know, this will become increasingly important over the, the next 10 to 20 years. Increase in electrification. So at the COP26, uh, more than 100 stakeholders signed a declaration to speed up the transition to 100% uh, zero emissions in cars and vans by 2035. Um, I think Giles actually touched on this earlier when he was talking. So with this, the electrified bus and heavy duty segments are gaining momentum. And obviously, inevitably, this is going to have a uh, this is going to have effect on the load curve. The EVs do offer solutions to this but it's all about having the right technology. Um, I mentioned that we conducted a, a poll, a survey after we put out our white paper earlier on this year. And some of the trends um, that we seen in terms of you know, what our customers see, are seeing, we asked them specifically what technologies and trends do they think will have the biggest impact on the energy market in the future. So interestingly, we actually conducted this also, uh, we conducted this a year ago as well. And when we conducted this um, a year ago, uh, we've, we've seen quite a significant upturn in batteries and EVs. Um, so renewables and, and new technologies, uh, there was an increase there as well but not as much as we you know saw the pre in the previous years um, but the the large the largest even though it doesn't appear to be quite as large here this the under demand side participation this increased quite significantly um, some of the key things that we pulled out from that were the growing need for flexibility so as we are transitioning more and more into renewables flexibility is going to be a key major player with that as long as you have the correct technology um, storage obviously and key grid assets is going to play a huge huge part in that as well the demand response market is moving to mainstream um, we're seeing this globally and i think you know the market and price volatility is here to stay and we're we all are acceptant of that and it's not going anywhere. So for, you know, for our market, the growing opportunity to gain revenue is through smart optimization of assets with the right technology in the right markets and at the right time. In the Australian market, um, obviously we're all, we all know what the, uh, the AMO uh, NEM is over here. It goes across the Eastern States of Australia. Uh, Gas commodity price is linked with Europe through liquid natural gas export market. And I guess for the planning for decarbonisation by 2050, what we're going to see is a doubling of demand. 
obviously the phased retirement of coal and gas and then the transition into renewables. Um, this is going to grow quite significantly from 15 gigawatts, you know, up to 200 gigawatts. And this requires 35 gigawatts of storage to accommodate it. Some of the challenges in the market um, that we've seen in the last 12 months, obviously we're all, we all remember when the market was suspended for 10 days back in June 2022. Um, and these energy shortfalls led to an impossible operation. You know, it was impossible to operate situation. And peak prices were actually seen over 15K during this time. Um, I'm going to pass on to my colleague, Ed now, and Ed will continue the presentation. Thanks guys. Thank you, Lisa. I'll just uh, share my screen. Give me a minute. Uh, please let me know if you can see my screen. We're seeing it, but um, you probably just need to go one step further to make it a full screen, I think. Is that better? Yes. Awesome. Uh, uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, uh, um, this is Ed, uh, yeah. uh, director for Was Great. I hope you can hear me well. Can you hear me? You can? Yeah, we can hear you now. And now you've got the full screen. At least it's arrived in my laptop. So it's all good. Okay, off you go. Ed. Thanks, man. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, my name's Ed. I'm the regional director for Grid Beyond Australia. Um, so Lisa's giving you a bit of a background about trends that look, I'll, uh, me and Lisa are primarily focused on FCAS um, services in Australia, but I'll give you a bit of a background about our services that we offer um, for CNI energy users um, in Australia and globally. Um, so starting with demand response, so we provide ancillary services, um, FCAS, as I mentioned before, uh, we can um, uh, provide uh, FCAS for very fast, fast, uh, slow and delayed. And we also provide asset level control um, and these services can be stacked together as well. Um, as part of our um, energy, um, as, sorry, I'm just gonna go back a little bit, sorry. Yep, as part of our part two uh, net zero um, services, uh, we can provide um, solar, uh, EV charging points, battery storage and, and carbon uh, and net zero reporting as well. Uh, we are also focused on um, energy analytics, where we can provide you energy consumption metering, uh, consumption reporting, uh, benchmarking, uh, fault finding, as well as virtual energy manager. Uh, we also have um, energy, um, uh, we also have resilience um, that we currently in Australia, we, we haven't, uh, so all the services that I just mentioned, um, we also have real-time forecasting, uh, peak avoidance, but these are services that we do provide in Australia, but we haven't uh, really got into the resilience uh, side of things. But we are looking to get into uh, resilience in Australia, where we'll be looking at um, uh, funding options through gas and battery storage. But this is just a just an overview of some of our services. But um, our focus, as I said, is FGAS for me and Lisa. So I'll go on to the next slide, which is which focuses on uh, FGAS. So what is frequency uh, response? Um, frequency response is basically the adjustment of uh, demand or uh, supply in response to changes uh, in the electricity grid. Um, now the AMO has a legal mandate um, to basically keep the electricity supply frequency operating within 1% of the standard 50 Hertz. Now, as you can see on your screen, um, you'll see that there's a normal operating band of 50 Hertz. Um, and as you see on the left-hand side, the orange bit, which talks about how frequency has deviated and there's an the intervention required. So when the normal operating frequency deviates, um, then an intervention is required. And as um, you go further towards the, the left-hand side, we see the frequency has deviated significantly, has gone into the red. So Basically, FGAS is a mechanism where the AMO has uh, a mandate to, to keep that frequency within that 1% of the standard 50 hertz or 50 cycles per, per second. Now, the traditional approach is that you, you increase the generation uh, or you decrease the generation depending on 
um, the, the frequency, whether it's less than 50 hertz or greater than 50 hertz. But with Grid Beyond, uh, what we can do is we can, we can decrease the demand um, by automatically controlling your energy consuming units, which is your furnaces, your refrigeration assets, your pumps. Or if the frequency has gone greater than 50 hertz, we can increase your demand by automatically controlling your energy consuming units. So now what does that all mean uh, in Australia? What does the FGAS market actually look like in Australia? So that four uh, responses, um, there's, there's, there's very fast response, there is fast, slow and delayed. Now for the very fast response, if your assets can respond um, for a duration of six seconds, and if they can in, um, respond within one second, then you, you basically can participate in a very fast FCAS. Now the assets that are usually suitable are refrigeration assets, uh, cement mills, wood grinders. Uh, there's some of the examples uh, for uh, businesses or assets that can typically participate in very fast. Mind you, the very fast FCAS actually kicks in in October of 2023. So at this very moment in Australia, we have fast, slow, and delayed. Um, with the fast one, um, the, the duration of the response can be up to 60 seconds. And the response, as long as your assets can respond within uh, six seconds, then you can participate in fast, uh, fast FCAS. With the slow response, uh, the duration of the um, FCAS event can be up to five minutes. And how fast your response can be, it'll be 60 seconds. So you can see some of the examples below where it talks about pelletizers um, for animal stock feed mills or CHP turbines. Those are typically the, um, the assets that can respond to, um, to, to slow FCAS. And the last one um, is delayed, which is basically um, where uh, the response can be up to five minutes as long as can, your assets can respond within five minutes of the event. And um, some of the assets that I mentioned there, the metal furnaces, glass furnace boosters, pelletizers, CHP turbines, we've seen that they typically can respond to uh, delayed F gas as well. Now, what does that all mean uh, in terms of um, um, monetization? Um, how does that help you as if you're a business, if you have these assets where you have the flexibility, how do you monetize this, uh, this flexibility? So we've come up with, an, um, with a bit of an example about how it looks like. So how much revenue can you generate with FGAS? So let's say you're looking at a one megawatt of flexible load that's available 24 seven. And if you can participate in fast, slow and delayed, mind you, I haven't included, or we haven't included the very fast because it kicks in October this year. Um, but if you're a business that has one megawatt of flexible load available 24 seven, then you could be looking at a total revenue of about $227,000 um, for that year, which is um, if, you, if you have, let's say for example, a 10 megawatt of uh, flexible load, they could be looking at $2.27 million. Um, moving on to how often do you have to turn off your loads? Um, so, Customers, um, first of all, it's important to note that when you participate in FGAS, if there's an F actual FGAS event that's gonna happen, it, if it doesn't actually materialize, then you still actually get paid um, for that FGAS um, participation, even if the FGAS event is actually not uh, materialized. Um, and in the last two years, there've been all up about nine FGAS events and none of those FCAS events were longer than six seconds. And, and so there'd be no events or zero events in both slow and delayed FCAS. Um, so you can see on your, the, the screen, the year 2021, and uh, there were five FCAS events, no longer than six seconds. And in 2022, there were four events for fast FCAS. Um, so if you were a one megawatt, if you had a one megawatt flexible load in fast, slow and delayed FCAS, and um, that would basically generate you about $227,000 for turning down your load for four events in 2022, lasting no longer than 24 seconds. And so I hope that gives you an idea of what that monetization of energy flexibility looks like. Um, 
Uh, moving on to what the, the process that we follow at, at Grid Beyond and how we go about assessing the flexibility for um, your assets is that our engineers will basically look at your, your, your site um, for any uh, flexible load. We'll identify exactly what your critical and non-critical loads look like. And then we work with you to understand your operations. Um, we'll, we can actually get down to the site, do a site audit, to understand what those critical loads and non-critical loads look like and what assets can actually participate in FCAS and, and for how long. Now, with uh, more than 10 years of experience uh, doing this, we, we understand what kind of assets will work for each service and we can ensure that you get maximum return with, with uh, no impact to your operations whatsoever. And in the next stage, we, we look at um, automating this. So we don't we, we deploy um, our advanced technology with our hardware and software to basically automate your control signals to the PLC. And, and there's no manual intervention required whatsoever. Uh, everything is automated. So you can get access to the faster schemes because if it's not automated, you'll not be able to respond within the one second, the six seconds that it's basically um, uh, required here. Um, and and um, with, with the automation, uh, at, the, at the end, we also do uh, provide you uh, access to, to AMO. So AMO has um, quite complex rules, but we do everything that is required in regards to, to speaking with AMO and, and basically following the rules in terms of what needs to be done for you to continue to, to participate in FCAS events. Um, these are some of our success uh, stories of uh, customers globally that we we manage uh, and uh, can have a look at uh, some of the customers and uh, some of the battery customers on food, logistics, businesses, um, some glass, metals, uh, mills, chemicals, um, commerce, um, pulp and paper. Um, these are these are some of our uh, businesses that we we manage. Some of our success stories, and uh, down below you can also see some of our key uh, key partners across the globe. Um, that's that's from me. Uh, over to you, Giles. Oh, look, thanks very much, Ed, and thanks very much, Lisa, as well. Hey, you look, we've got a bunch of questions here. Some of them have sort of been answered already, but we'll we'll probably throw them out to the sort of um for a sort of open discussion. I thought I might just sort of, because we've just come away from the um, presentation, just sort of talk about some of these FCAS specific um, questions. Um, Ed, can you stop um, screen sharing just for the moment so we can see our beautiful images, faces of the panel? If you, um, Ed, if you can just stop screen sharing. One second here um there we go cool okay now we've got the uh the panelists up there um, there's a couple of questions about who can play in the fcas markets um um ed and maybe um maybe just speak from the, from the last one you know it says this is from Stephen. fcas markets are generally considered to be shallow to what extent do you expect them to grow or will the opportunity to participate become saturated and there's a couple of other questions there about can gas turbines fit into the FCAS response and also the monitoring of FCAS performance from an industrial plant? Ed um, or Lisa, are you able to have a go at those questions? So the first question, can you just repeat the first question, the monetite, what was the first question, Charles? Oh, just about the, you know, the, the yeah, look, it's up there on the Q&A thing, but FCAS markets are generally considered to be shallow. Um, to what extent do we expect them to grow or would the opportunity to participate become saturated? Yeah, the, um, they're definitely going to grow. As we transition more and more out of uh, thermal energy into renewables, it's going to be more and more, um, like FCAS is going to be more and more uh, prevalent, pre prevalent in the market. So we see in uh, our other countries that we... Uh, currently and globally that it's certainly not going backwards it's trending more and more to to increase and I think um, you know what sort of confirms that for us is Ed mentioned throughout the presentation that previously there were three schemes within NEVCAS or the currently is being fast slow and delayed and obviously the uh, AMO is looking to bring in a new speed um, 
in October being very fast. In terms of, you know, who can participate going on to the, the second question, I guess, um, you know, any, you know, Technically, you can, if your organisation is big enough and you have more than one megawatt of flexible load, you can participate yourself. However, the key is technology. So the, te the, the technology that is required to be able to support um, the, the reaction time and the re reaction speed to be able to partici participate in those schemes is the tricky thing. So from our experience and our, you know, our knowledge of certainly global markets and here in Australia, um, there's not, you know, not all, not all companies and ag aggregators currently can facilitate even the six, seven, six seconds response speed. Um, so we speak to clients regularly who are already participating themselves in the scheme, um, but because their software and their technology, um, you know, it's it's more a manual process. It's not actually allowing them to be able to participate in some of the other schemes being fast and obviously very fast it's coming. So they're missing out on a lot of revenue. So the faster the speed and the, the more the quicker that you can actually respond, the more revenue that is available. To give you a bit of an indication on that, currently um, very fast is more than you know the amount of money you revenue you can you can actually earn just for participating opposed to you know, delayed is more than double being in that scheme. So yes, technically anyone that has a megawatt can actually participate and on their own without an aggregator. They do have to register with AMO directly though. However, However you know, by not using, by not partnering with an aggregator that has, you know, the right technology, you could potentially be missing out on a lot of revenue. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Lisa. That sort of us so that um, you're required to participate in the market. Um, um, and I'm just wondering if you, you can perhaps address this one as back to how do you show you've turned down your load when you should have? I guess that comes back to your technologies. It's probably a bit of a free gift for you. <laughs> ben? Hello? Sorry, I've lost you, Giles. I've lost you for a sec. Sorry, go ahead. I couldn't hear you, Giles, sorry. Is that us or Giles? Is that us or is it you, Giles? <laughs> I think Giles is frozen, so... I think he's frozen. Maybe we can have a look at some of the questions. Yeah, I can see a question here uh, in the Q&A, which is to do with gas turbines. I think, uh, is it Behram Safai? Uh, hi, where would gas turbines fit in the F-gas response? Uh, and the answer is that, yes, there's definitely an opportunity with gas turbines. Um, um, there's definitely we're talking to some customers right now uh, where we can definitely see uh, flexibility and their participation in FGAS is definitely a possibility. Excellent. I might jump in while uh, Giles is rebooting. Uh, there's there's a question or five questions from Arno. I think I've I've answered uh, one of the questions in the chat about the workforce. It is a hugely important question. I think Australia really needs to uh, focus down on the work skills required. We need to build the manufacturing capacity. We need to onshore the supply chains. Um, and that means we need to actually rebuild the training systems that have been largely dismantled by the previous government over the last decade. I would be arguing we need to really step up apprenticeships. We need to have a very, very targeted um, immigration program and uh, obviously immigration in the last two or three years has been effectively zero with COVID. It's now re-stepping up dramatically. We need to target the right skill sets and we have to realise Australia is in a, in a worker skill race against the rest of the world. You can't have America investing 800 billion US dollars in accelerating onshore manufacturing and everything to do with decarbonisation without everyone wanting to go and work in America or in Europe or in China or in Japan. So uh, I think we need to be really cognizant of the work skill shortages. Uh, but on the other hand, we are also leading the world in some of these technologies. And so, so rooftop solar, for example. So we are actually at the front of the technology adoption so we can learn by doing. And then what I'd also emphasise is we've got to play to our strengths. Australia is one of the world's top two or three mining countries in the world. We have 
five or six or seven or eight of the biggest mining companies operating in Australia, there are a huge number of skilled mining workers and there are a huge number of power plant workers. We just need to redeploy them to industries of the future. That might mean moving location, but at the end of the day, we do have huge mining skills, both workers and capacity in terms of the mining companies. So I think there's just a huge amount of opportunity. So I know your question's fair, Mary's question's fair, but uh, I think we can overcome it. Uh, it does mean a concerted government um, intervention. I, I, Having worked in the financial markets for 20 or 30 years, at the end of the day, financial markets are great, but we need the government to set the right policy framework to set the regulation and drive action. And uh, maybe Arno's final question, how do we make sure that the um, the less well off half of the world or half of Australia doesn't get smashed with the cost. That's usually the outcome. Uh, I think we have to be really careful. The federal government and the state governments are working on that right now to try and, uh, and alleviate some of that pain. But at the end of the day, we've got to remember that Ian Chalmers inherited a um, so Jim Chubb has inherited a uh, trillion dollars of debt thanks to Josh Frydenberg. So we do need, as Arno is suggesting, I've been calling for windfall profit tax. You can't have BP, Shell, Exxon, Chevron, you name it, Total, all operating in Australia and paying zero corporate tax in Australia. Exxon pays a lot of tax in America. Why is it that they're allowed or the rules can be manipulated that Exxon and Chevron and BP and Shell don't pay corporate tax here? They have to pay some corporate tax so that, that the federal government can afford to actually protect the people most affected by their war profiteering. And I've also argued we need progressive royalties. We need a review of the PRRT. It's been game to buggery. It, it gets about a 3% royalty revenue. We get at least 8% in coal. In Queensland, they get 12 to 15% in coal. Why does uh, LNG only pay a 3% royalty federally? Now, we did see Cameron Dick change the Queensland LNG export royalties. He's now getting 5%. But um, why five? Why not 34%, which is what the Indian government gets on every single tonne of coal produced and used in India? 34%, not a, not a progressive rate. That's the average rate. Now, we could go to Norway and quote a 60 or 70 or 80% royalty rate and a corporate tax rate. But at the end of the day, I think the fossil fuel companies making ridiculously high profits need to be held to account in our country. We can't rely on the OECD to do something. They've been stuffing around for eight years talking about international tax transparency. Uh, at the end of the day, let's remember the OECD is primarily Europe and America where most of the tax havens all sit and where all those corporates actually are re residents. So we need to have Australia protect our interests. Giles, back to you. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry, guys. I just sort of sipped up the um, the NBN decided it was going to have a bit of a midday nap, so um, I had to sort of uh, um, get out my woozy board and um, and connect somewhere else. Um, so I might have missed a couple of the answers of the questions. And Tim, look, I, I agree on this some um, super profits thing. It's really interesting to note how um, the ACT, which is the only jurisdiction in Australia to get to 100% renewables with wind and solar effectively, and I know it's just like a, a balancing thing. They supply the equivalent. But what's really interesting is the way they've structured that. So if there's any sort of super profits that were going to be coming from wind and solar, it actually goes back to the customers. And um, maybe they've got to find some way of actually making that... Um, making that happen um, elsewhere. Tim, I don't know whether you asked the question about the safeguards. There's a couple of questions about the safeguards mechanism. I don't know whether you um, got to that while I was um, trying to get the NBN working again. I thought we might just sort of touch on that just before we go back to some of the um, the details about the sort of the grid transition. Um, do you have um, do you have something on that? Sure, Giles. Um, I did put a, a written response in, but I think it's a really important discussion. There's actually a major conference down in Parliament House today uh, by a lot of environmental groups working with the Greens, working with uh, David Pocock. Um, but at the end of the day, I think they're missing the point. At the end of the day, we know the ACU system under Angus Taylor had flaws. I think Professor McIntosh has made that really clear. But the Chubb Review is all about looking forward. Well, we can cry over spilt milk. We can um, throw rocks at uh, Angus Taylor. It's an easy target. 
Uh, but at the end of the day, we actually need to move our country forward at a rate of knots. And I don't want to spend a lot of time crying over spilt milk and a wasted decade of opportunity. I want to look at the opportunities for Australia. They are once in a century opportunity. Finance, we need hundreds of billions of dollars of investment. So not just the National Reconstruction Fund, 15 billion, we need hundreds of billion. That's going to have to come from our $3.3 trillion super funds. It's going to come from corporates. It's going to, going to, going to come from our major banks. Um, so they need to have the confidence and the right policy framework and price signal. So why am I talking about that? Because the safeguard mechanism at its core is about establishing a firm regulated price on carbon emissions. Capped at $75 in first year, fiscal 24, but rising at inflation plus 2% per annum, which means we'll be looking at a price cap of $100 a tonne by 2030, $130 by 2035. And then the Chris Bowen is talking about international linkage to high schemes of integrity, such as the EU ETS. That would double the price overnight if we did that. So the price is going one direction upwards with the safeguard mechanism. And that is what we need. We need a price on carbon for too long. For decades, we've let fossil fuel companies pollute for free. And I think they've had their 20 or 30 years of pollution. They now need to be held to account. Now, the safeguard mechanism also has one key factor. It's got a key ratchet up factor, which is that in year one, they reduce emissions by 7 million tonnes per year in year one, but it's 7 million on a declining base. So it's actually 5.8% annual reduction in emissions from those 215 facilities over the next seven years. So it's not aligned with the science, but it's a hell of a lot better. When we were in reverse for a decade, we've got to start walking and then running before we start sprinting. So I know Adam Bant is appealing to the climate science. He's working with the climate science, but the reality is we've been in reverse for a decade. We can't deliver on the climate science right now. We need to start moving in the right direction. So long answer, Joyce. I think the safeguard mechanism is a critically important uh, policy initiative by the federal government, but it's not in isolation. We've got the methane pledge. We've got the scope two, 82% renewables, Giles, that you talked about. We've got um, the EV policy. We have all sorts of policies. And uh, we saw the federal government ban the first new proposed coal mine virtually in Australian history last month. So I think we're moving absolutely in the right direction. We need to build that momentum and lock it in for a couple of, well, for, for a decade, not just have a one, one term ALP government. Okay, thanks very much, Tim. I'm just wondering if we can bring the conversation back. I seem to have lost access to the um, the Q and A things, the, both the um, questions and the answered ones. So I'm kind of sort of um, sort of feeling in a bit um, bit of a loose end there. But um, Lisa and Ed, when you're sort of thinking about you know the grid and your technologies and what you're providing for, are you sort of you know, and when you're sort of talking to you know your colleagues and your peers and um, even just your families when they're still talking about this transition to 100% renewables and what we've heard is even beyond that you know 200% 500% 700% are you sort of very confident now that we've got the know-how and the technologies to get there it's sort of obviously a refining of sort of products and reforms and market rules and stuff like that I mean how are you sort of thinking about that? Ed, do you want to go? I missed the, sorry, Giles, I missed the last bit of the question because I think you were frozen. <laughs> I was just wondering, <laughs> I'm just wondering how you're sort of thinking about that in terms of sort of the transition and your confidence that this is actually going to happen. I mean, you've sort of talked about some of the specifics of what you guys are offering in terms of dealing with the FCAS markets and things like that, but in sort of a broader sort of ecosystem of sort of moving towards, you know, 100% renewables and beyond. I mean, are you sort of, you know, do you look at this and think about, yeah, we can do this. Um, we've got the technologies. We need certain refinements here, obviously in markets and market signals and possibly policies. But, you know, basically we have the resources at hand to be able to get there. Look, I, I'm, I'm very confident the way um, the transition has been in Australia. Uh, we're getting there. Um, in terms of technology, uh, I do see some gaps, um, but we, we're overcoming those gaps. The way I see, the way things are going, and I, uh, I, I'll actually give you an example. Um, I'm talking to a customer right now uh, who wanted to participate 
in FGAS and wanting to do this 10 years ago, um, but didn't have the technology to be able to, to, to do that because of their assets. But now we are talking to those customers who, are, who can actually do this with the kind of technology that, um, I mean, this is, this is not a sales pitch for Grid Beyond, but, but we have that technology now that they can actually participate in certain uh, types of FGAS and, and use their assets and find the flexibility in their assets to give you an example. But I definitely see that there's been progress. Um, yes, there are some gaps, but I'm sure that the way things are going, that we'll be overcoming those um, technology gaps very soon. Um, Lisa, do you have anything sort of to add, add, add to that? I mean, um, maybe you can, I don't know whether we got around to answering the, um, the, um, the skills-based questions um, and do we have the skills um, thing as well in, in my sort of NBN outage, but um, perhaps you can sort of reflect on that as well. Yeah, I think um, just to sort of back up what Ed said, my experience, you know, sort of uh, obviously working working in uh, renewables and working in a more sort of technology based company now, certainly, you know, the, what we're exposed to in terms of innovation and, you know, forward thinkingness and, and not so much here in Australia, but certainly globally, um, you know, the ingenuity in um, electric vehicles and infrastructure and, you know, there's so much to it. But from my perspective and, you know, from, you know, conversations I probably have around the dinner table with my family, definitely, I think that there are gaps, but we're definitely, you know, moving in the right direction. And I think that, um, when you throw in, you know, the, the volatility at the moment that we're seeing from Ukraine and Russia and, you know, and we, I think you spoke about it earlier, Giles, in regards to, you know, it sort of forced us or, or forced different parts of the world to, to move quicker and to get on the green the green move a lot sooner than what they had originally expected. And, and we're doing it, you know, we're, we're just, we're coping and we're getting through. So, Definitely. I think that we do have the right technology and we'll continue to innovate and bring in new technologies. And yeah, I'm pretty confident that we should be able to, yeah, have a greener world. <laughs> Tim, Tim, what are you sort of thinking when you're sort of talking? Of, you know, if, if we go back a couple of years, in fact, gosh, if you just read sort of, you know, so much now, there's there's all this sort of scepticism about, no, we can't do this, we can't get there. We, you know, I mean, do you think there's just like this broader acceptance now that we are on this track? You know, the technologies that could be on to bringing and so many other people are bringing, um, you know, we're sort of, um, you know, we're, we're so far down the track in, in states like South Australia. Do you think that um, the fact that we now know that we can do this is sort of helping to sort of accelerate this or is there... Or are we seeing the last stand of the um, of the uh, of the fossil fuel brigade with their pitchforks and the bridge type of thing? Yeah, I, you're right. I immediately recall a conversation I had with the chief engineer of the South Australian grid um, operator about seven years ago, and he said to me, "Tim, there is no way we can handle 20% variable renewable energy penetration." And now they're dealing with 100% penetration instantaneously, virtually every every couple of weeks or days. And uh, he actually, like, he was the chief engineer and I was listening to him and I was thinking okay well the guy's got 35 he wasn't employed by a fossil fuel company he just was an engineer who was worried about the speed of transition and and worrying about the downside of it but I think we've overdone the worry like climate science luddites undermine and use whatever arguments they can so grid reliability but this was an engineer who was tasked with managing south australia which now as we all know is the highest penetration of variable renewable energy in the world and grid reliability has gone up and their price of power relative to the rest of australia has gone down because of it so it's a proof that the engineers are at AEMO and, and the operators, I'm not in any way digging at them, They're, they actually have to do their job. They have one of the key requirements is to serve and ensure the reliability of our grid. But I think we can see that South Australia is the perfect litmus test of grid reliability going up and technology um, going through the roof rather than, and, and the problems being overestimated, the risks being overestimated and the opportunities massively underestimated. And I'll also, um, yeah, so it, no, that's that's my key point that uh, 
we've overestimated the risks and we've underestimated the opportunities. And so I think the narrative is really shifting about the opportunities. And uh, I, I, I mean, I'll pivot to India for a second. India has a grid, one national grid, which services 1.4 billion people. Now, their re variable renewable energy penetration is 11%. And yet, Every conversation I have with even the renewable energy players, but the NTPC, the grid operator, the government of India, they all go, oh, but we can't worry. We have to worry about grid reliability. Now, I remind them that most of their citizens have six hours of outages most days of the year and that they have 100 gigawatts of diesel generator backup that costs you 15 rupees a kilowatt hour to run and are really noisy and really expensive and all relying on Im imported diesel when you can do solar at two and a half rupees and wind at three rupees. And I just point to South Australia and say India actually has the biggest national grid in the world, like bigger than even China. China's got two grids. Japan's got two grids. America's got eight grids. We've got two or three. Um, so India's actually got one. So I think people constantly use grid reliability and intermittency of wind and solar as a reason to go slow. We need to go fast. The science says we need to go fast. The cost the cost of living, as uh, Anna asks about, requires us to go fast because we know domestic energy security and deflation and grid reliability all go hand in hand with decarbonisation. Thanks very much, Tim. Look, um, I think we're going to probably wrap up the webinar um, now. Um, Even or Lisa, is there any sort of final thoughts to to share with the audience? Um, look, I just think from Ed and my point of view, Grid Beyond, just thanks for having us here today and hosting, and especially to Tim. I really enjoyed listening to both of you, Tim and Giles, today. It's been great. Um, I love, <laughs> I love. Uh, learning as much as I possibly can and continue to learn as I go. And um, yeah, you guys are, yeah, very, very, uh, very happy that you had us here today. So thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, you and Ed and Grid Beyond for um, hosting, um, sponsoring this webinar. It was great to hear about your technologies and what you guys can provide in sort of, you know, valuable contribution to the sort of decarbonisation of the grid. Um, Thanks to you, Tim, um, for your wonderful insight as usual. And look, thanks for everyone out there for um, listening and also for asking questions. And apologies if I didn't get your questions, but when I had my outage and I came back and um, um, I couldn't see the damn things. But look, I think we've probably covered everything. So look, once again, thank you very much. And we look forward to our next webinar. Um, um, I'd love to be able to tell you, but um, just a final thought too, this will be up on the website and people can listen to it again. So um, thanks for now. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.